to all joining us this morning. My name is Adele Croft and I'm from Food Focus and I want to thank the Dairy Standard Agency for sponsoring this webinar. It's a pleasure for me this morning to have Yompi with us and Yompi is going to introduce um, the topic as well as um, introduce the speakers to you. So Yompi, thank you so much for being with us today and um, yes, over to you. Yeah, good morning. Good morning to everybody. And again, it's a privilege on behalf of the Dairy Standard Agency to talk to you. And, um, and thank you also for Food Focus to that's making this whole webinar sessions um, possible. To this morning, a special welcome to the SABS members that are going to handle the presentations for us. We have Veronica and Charles and Tabu. I'm not going to mention the surnames that will come up later on. But thank you so much for making it possible uh, for joining us. I think we're on a very uh, hot topic here this morning, uh, talking about the detergents and disinfectants and the whole issue about the certification process, uh, specifically referring to the dairy industry, where sometimes there's a lot of uh, uncertainty what is regarded to be a certified product in terms of the uh, South African national standards and the SABS. And it's, it's really a great privilege to have the SABS explaining this entire process for the industry. And also, uh, it's nice to meet the SABS and get closer to our certification body and our standards authority in South Africa. So once again, thank you uh, for you, uh, Veronica, Charles, and Tabu. I think, Veronica, you are going to be first, followed by Tabu and then Charles. Um, <clears throat> As I have it, Adele, you will introduce them, the, the, uh, the bios, biographies, and then um, we can go ahead. So really, thank you so much. And we are looking forward to learn from you about the process of certification and what it means to carry a SABS uh, certification in the process. Thank you so much. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much, Yompi. And once again, it's so awesome having you. We know you're a bit, very busy man, so it's a great pleasure for us having you this morning as well. And yes, like Yombi has said, firstly, I would like to introduce uh, Veronica Malapane. Veronica is a supervisor leading the team responsible for the development and the maintenance and the promotion of the South African national standards in the chemicals and the textile sector. She has been with the SABS for 11 years in different roles within the standardization field. Veronica believes that standardization has many benefits for products, manufacturers, users, customers, and traders. She is well equipped with the processes of developing and maintaining standards locally, regionally, and on international platforms. She is passionate about standardization and the regulatory framework and standardization may as well be her middle name. So Veronica, we would really looking forward to your presentation, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to introduce all the speakers and then after that, um, they will present. And please, all questions, we're gonna have sessions after everybody has presented. So when you post your question in the question bar, Please say that your question is uh, focused on Veronica or Tabu or Charles. So the second presentation will be from Tabu Tlongwane. Tabu is a food safety professional with over 15 years of experience in a quality management environment, ranging from the development and the implementation of QMS and conducting QMS training and audits. He is currently employed by SABS as a standard development superior and he is responsible for facilitating the development of South African national standards and in food and in health. And then lastly but not least we have Charles Sabia. Charles has a BSc degree in chemistry and biochemistry as well as a postgraduate diploma in business management and marketing. He has 30 years of work experience in the chemical industry, food and beverage packaging, 
and industrial chemical and detergents, of which the last 14 years are at SABS, and he is involved, was involved with the labs at the SABS for the past 10 years in certification. So audience, you can see that um, we've got the cream of the SABS with us this morning, and we can't thank them enough for their valuable time. So without further ado, Veronica, I am going to um, hand over to you for your presentation, and um, we are really looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Morning, morning, everyone, and thank you, Adele, for that extensive and very kind introduction. That is very me. You've, sum you've summarized me pretty well. So um, I'm going to just hop straight into it. Um, the outline of my presentation will be as follows. I'm going to speak about the mandate of the SABS, the committee constitution, the code of conduct for the committees, and the development of South African national standards, and touch a little bit on the cleaning chemicals for use in the food industry. Thank you. So um, I'm sure most people are familiar with the SABS. However, for those who are not, the SABS was established by the Standards Act of 1945. And right now it operates under the Standards Act, which was amended in 2008, which is Act 8 of 2008. Um, the Act mandates the SABS to develop, to promote and maintain South African national standards to promote quality with respect to commodities, products and services for the domestic and export markets, to provide conformity assessment services uh, like certification, testing, inspection and local content verification. The SABS uh, as it is, is the only national standards body in South Africa and being the only standards body that is mandated to maintain membership in the international and foreign bodies, having similar objectives or the scope of work. Uh, it is important for us to highlight before we move on that standards are in fact not regulations. However, regulatory authorities should whenever possible make use of uh, national standards in their regulatory work. Regulatory authorities should en endeavor to apply and refer to standards. Uh, my next slide sh there shows uh, the membership that the SABS holds with international bodies and some regional bodies. Uh, the two most uh, top international bodies, standardization bodies that we have a membership with is ISO, the International Organization of Standardization, and the IEC. And then regionally, we are members of ARZO, we are members of AFSEC, we are members of SADEXTEN, we are members of the CFTA and the PA. SC, the Pacific Area Standards Congress, and then we also share a vision in the Commonwealth Standards Network. Okay, I'm going to move on to the constitution of our technical committees. So membership to SABS technical committees is granted on an organizational basis. Membership shall not be granted to an organization which seek to only advance its own uh, proprietary interests. Any individual or body deemed to be exploiting membership solely for its own commercial advantage may be suspended or removed from the committees by the Standards Approvals Committee. Uh, the SABS committees shall be constituted to the representative of relevant national interests related to the scope of the committee. Organizations wishing to have more than one representative in the committee are expected to justify such a request for SEC to approve. The constitution of the committee shall come under regular scrutiny by the Standards Approvals Committee. 
Okay, so uh, I've also outlined the structures of our technical committees. Our technical committee is made up of a chairperson and a secretariat, and it has P members and O members. So these P members and the O members that are to, uh, I am talking about, they are members of the public, the organizations that wish to take part in the development process of the standards that the SABS develops. So the SABS on its own, it cannot function and develop standards. The SABS relies deeply on the industry and the sectors that we service. So we cannot say, for example, we are going to develop a standard for cleaning detergents. What we are going to do, we are going to lead the project for developing such a standard. So the people who will be, in fact, giving us content which will go into those standards is the people of the industry and the people uh, um, out there, anyone that will be affected by that standard can in fact apply to sit on our uh, technical committees and that is uh, the group that would develop the, the, the documents. And then below the, the technical committees, we have working groups and subcommittees. Um, subcommittees means uh, like, for example, chemicals is a, is, a, is a huge sector. So if we're going to have subcommittees, another subcommittee maybe will deal with a uh, clean chemicals and then the other uh, group will deal with uh, the disinfectants such such and such yeah and then we again have working groups working groups are the group of experts we, which actually sit and come up with those uh, particular requirements that you see in the standards um, I'm guessing I'm gonna get uh, many questions regarding this slide later on so I'll cover that when we get to that point Okay. Uh, again, our co uh, our committees are guided by the code of conduct because we have groups of people. We found it imperative that we have a code of conduct so that people who are part of our committees, they would know how to treat each other, how to respect each other. So any individual that is nominated by his or uh, her organization to represent the organization in the SABS committee shall sign this code of conduct. And if in the view of the committee secretariat in consultation with the committee chairperson, the representative of a member has transgressed the code, such a member shall be removed from our technical committees. Transgression of the code may lead to the individual being denied future participation in the SABS committees or working groups. Uh, the nominating organizations shall have an opportunity to object to the decision to remove its representative, but this objection shall be, shall be made to the Standards Approvals Committee. Okay, I've highlighted a few principles there. For that are uh, inside the code of conduct. The first one will be uh, the committee must agree to work for the net benefit of the South African economy. So it is important to recognize that even if we are part of the technical committees in the SABS, the work that we are doing, it must be for the benefit of South Africa and the South African uh, uh, community. What, me, what we mean is that the standards that we develop, they are not meant to enrich or empower certain individual but we wish for our standards to be of the greater benefit of South Africa maybe for the protect uh, for, for the protection of our consumers for all enterprises small big enterprises medium enterprises to benefit from this work uh, another principle is to uphold the consensus process uh, to agree to a clear purpose and the scope to respect others and to participate actively in the committees. Okay, so I'm going to touch a bit on the development of South African national standards. So what happens in the SABS is that what happens on the SABS is that we receive proposals from the um, from the public. For example, the public might say we need a standard for the detergents for 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 for, for, for the cleaning detergents that are used in the the um, food industry. So once we receive that proposal, we have a stage that is called a new work item proposal stage. So that is where the SABS is gonna research and scrutinize. Uh, um, 
scrutinize that proposal. So once that is done, uh, that proposal will be assigned to the technical committee that is going to work on developing that standard. So after that technical committee um, work on that standard, develop the standard, put in the requirements into that standard, that, uh, that is the drafting stage actually, then uh, we're going to move to approval. Approval is whereby the content of our standards is now transferred to the SEC for approval. And once that standard is approved, by the SEC, it can now be used and applied as a South African national standard. Okay, so the uh, slide that I want to talk to mostly because of this webinar is regarding the cleaning chemicals for the use in the industry. The standard thereof that is being applied is since 1828. Since 1828 is the, the designation of the standard, the title is uh, titled uh, that as well, cleaning chemicals for use in the food industry. So this standard specifies general requirements for cleaning chemicals intended for use in the food industry. It also sets minimum requirements for the safety of such cleaning chemicals, which are intended for use in the food processing industry and that might come into contact with food products. The standard does not set clean, cleaning performance standards. The user is, however, urged to verify by conducting suitable trials or tests either in the food processing plant or in the laboratory that the cleaning chemicals are suitable for the proposed application. Alternatively, proven compliance with appropriate national standards should be requested. The standard shall not cover products that are used for the cleaning for, for cleaning of toilets, bathrooms, offices, and all supportive environments to the food to the food processing environment. Okay, since 1828 in this instance, it was developed and is being maintained by the SABS Technical Committee 1006, which is responsible for the detergent standards. The latest version of the standard was recently published in 2023, I think earlier this year, yeah. So compliance with the SABS national standards, that the SABS believed that could, uh, good quality foods are free from chemicals such as detergents and are of normal composition. So it is therefore imperative that the dairy industry employ the use of the cleaning chemicals and disinfectants that comply with the requirements of since 1828 and 1853 respectively. I think the other information will be given by my colleagues Tabo and uh, Charles. Looking forward to everybody's uh, questions later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica, for that. Really appreciate it. I think it's a very nice uh, background to explain what it is, how it started. And um, now we're going to go over to Tabo for his presentations. If there's any questions that you've got for Veronica, please make sure you can type them into the question bar now already so um, that I can collate the questions. So um, please feel free to do that if there's any questions from your side. So now we're going to go over to Tabo. Tabo, thank you so much. We're looking forward to your presentation. Okay. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, my presentation uh, is an addition from uh, what Veronica uh, spoke about. So for this presentation, I'll look at uh, the technical committee that is responsible for uh, the development of SANS 1853. And then within that uh, uh, technical committee will also maybe touch on uh, the number of standards that have been published. And then we'll also look at the program of work. So meaning we'll look at what other work uh, TC 1022 is doing. Okay, uh, as you can, as we all know, chemical uh, chemical products affect the environment, and disinfectants are no exception. So now, uh, because of that statement, SABS uh, uh, established a committee 1022 uh, 
uh, to make sure that we protect the environment with regard to chemicals and disinfectant. So now the scope of our technical committee 102022 uh, is to promote knowledge amongst industries, amongst individuals, uh, amongst uh, uh, um, uh, university, uh, 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 so that they can stimulate the research. The committee also develop uh, specifications uh, for chemicals and disinfectants test method we also uh, 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 develop. And then we also come with te terminologies that can be used in the food industry so that everyone can be able to understand. So now this committee 1022, uh, like I said, we develop the standards related to chemicals and disinfectants. So we can develop the standards from, uh, 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 from zero up until it is published. So as Veronica has said, once we get the proposal uh, to develop the standard, we'll appoint the relevant uh, uh, working group members to join the TC so that they can come with expert industry uh, 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 knowledge and we develop the standard. And if there's a standard somewhere in um, overseas ISO or even IEC, we as SABS, we can adopt that standard as it is. So uh, before we will adopt the standard, we'll also check if uh, that standard will be relevant for South African industry. Uh, if all the contents that are in that standard are relevant, then we'll adopt the standard as it is. However, you might find that certain clauses might not be relevant to South Africa. That's when now we can still adopt that standard and amend so that it can be applicable to us. Then the other thing that the technical committee do is maintain the standards. So colleagues, you know, you, you publish the standards today and then chances are in the next five years, the standard might no longer be relevant. So we have a process where, whereby as uh, SABS, each and every five years after the standard have, ha has been published, we have to go back and check if, uh, or to, re, uh, to review. So review, we are going back to check if the standard is still applicable in the industry. You might find that, yes, the standard is still applicable. Uh, companies are still using that standard. Then we'll reaffirm that standard for the next five years. However, if maybe a certain clause is no longer applicable in the industry, then members of the industry or even the uh, uh, TC members they can request an amendment whereby they say, no, uh, the content of the standard is still applicable. However, clause so and so, uh, we need to change maybe two sentences there. Then we can do an amendment. So usually when we do an amendment, amendment it's, a, it's a process that is going to take plus minus uh, uh, nine months. So during that process, uh, when we are reviewing the standard, uh, uh, the standard, someone might come and say, you know what, a lot of uh, clauses that are in this standard, they are no longer applicable. So we need to revise the standard. That's when now we're going to open a revision of the standard. And then a revision, it's, it can take a period between 18 to 24 months, depending on how the working group are going to work. And then lastly, uh, with the adoption, uh, something that I forgot to mention, is that when we adopt a standard uh, uh, from uh, other uh, uh, organizations, that adoption will take plus minus six months. Okay. And within our technical committee TC uh, 1022, we have published about 40 standards uh, up to date. So um, chances are we might get another proposal to uh, publish another standard and the number will keep on going up and up. Oh, and something that I forgot to mention again with the review of standards. If it does happen that uh, while we're doing the review and um, uh, we realize that the standard is no longer being used in South Africa, so SABS will be, or the TC will be able to withdraw the standard from the market, okay? Then the next point, we we'll look at the program of work. So TC 1022, uh, at the moment, we have uh, about seven projects that are running. As you can all see, I have highlighted um, since 1853, which is a, a, a point of discussion today. So there was a proposal that was received. Remember I said each and every five years, we review the standards. And then after reviewing the standard, we check if they're still applicable or not. So now at the moment, there's a proposal that we received for 1853 to revise the standard. 
So to revise it now, we are going back to check if each and every clause that is in the standard is applicable. So now uh, the proposal has been accepted and approved by SEC. Uh, SEC is standard approval committee, so they have approved uh, uh, the proposal to revise uh, since 1853. So at the moment, we are at that stage where we are calling on industry experts to come and join uh, uh, our working group so that uh, we can be able to revise and get all the information. Okay, um, as Veronica has said, uh, according to the Standard Act, we are mandated uh, to also be part of international bodies uh, that have the same scope of work like us. Uh, international bodies, as Veronica said, we are looking at ISO and your IEC. So our uh, technical committee, uh, uh, TC 1022, we, we are we are liaison officers with uh, European Committee of Standard Standardization, SANC TC 212, Chemical Disinfectants and Antiseptives. And regionally, uh, we are part of ARSO, so Afro, ARSO is our, our African body, standard body, so we, we, we are part of ARSO TC 35, Surface Active Agents. And nationally, we liaison with uh, TC 217, uh, cosmetics. We are also part of TC1039 uh, medical devices and uh, SABS TC1006 detergents. This is now the home where the standard that Veronica was talking about. Colleagues, we, we have seen uh, that uh, this diagram before it was displayed by, by Veronica. So I have it on my presentation so that we can see how the flow of the development will go. As Veronica has said, we have the technical committee. So remember the technical committee now, we are looking at 10.22, which where we are going to get the chemical standards. So in that technical committee, we have, like she said, we have chairperson, secretariat, P and an O member. Let's say now colleagues that are on the call now, uh, maybe someone wants to join the technical committee. So now when you join our TC2-1022, you need to indicate if you're going to be a P or an O member. So if you become a P member, that's when now your organization will be able to comment on documents they will be able to also vote on documents. So you are actually a participating member. However, if you choose to be an O member, an O member is an observer uh, member. So you will be part of the TC and you'll be observing the work that is done by the TC. So you can, you can comment on documents. However, you do not have the right to vote. If it does happen that maybe you join the technical committee and you are appointed as the chairperson of the committee, you as the chairperson, you are going to lose your right, your, your, your voting rights. So you will need to appoint somebody else from your organization that is going to take your seat as a, a member uh, uh, representing your own organization. I hope it makes sense. So usually with the secretariat, SABS, we hold the secretariat ship. So now, that is the technical committee. Remember I said 1853 now, we are in the process of revising the standard. So now when we are revising the standard, we are moving from the technical committee, we need to go to working groups. So now the technical committee must appoint a working group. So working group, this is a group of industry experts that have knowledge about uh, the scope of work of a particular standard, for instance, now 1853. Once we appoint uh, 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 working group members, though within the group, they need to have a convener. So someone like a chairperson, someone who's going to direct the work. And we are also going to require the experts. So at the moment, with regard to 1027, we have technical committee, and we are in, in the process of appointing working group members. If anyone who's part of the call today wants to be part of the working group, they can reach out to us and then we'll put their name forward. Okay, as we have said before, colleagues, when we develop standards, uh, we, we do not develop our standards in secret. We don't want to surprise uh, uh, industry people. We don't want to surprise South Africans. So our when we are working or developing a standard, we, we, we work on openness. Firstly, we receive a proposal 
after receiving a proposal, that proposal is taken to the relevant technical committee to deliberate on. They will look at the proposal if uh, maybe that proposal is something that is needed in South Africa or in the industry. They are going to approve the development of that standard. And we do not stop there. Once we are done, we take the very same proposal that was approved by the technical committee. We now take that same proposal to standard approval committee so that they can see. So these are now people that are not part of the, uh, the TC. So they will check the proposal. If they agree, then they are going to approve. From there, as SABS, uh, if it's a new standard, then a call for experts will be made. So experts will come and join the working groups, work on the document. Once everything is done, um, as part of our openness, that's where now we take the, uh, the document now back to the public. So it's what we call um, uh, public participation or in uh, SABS terms, DSS, draft, standard, draft South African standards. So we send it out so that the industry people that were not part of the TC or part of the working group, they can be able to see what uh, the working group worked on. So now the industry people will be allowed to comment, to raise any comments that they have on the standard. Uh, if they are happy with the standard, they will not comment. So once that uh, uh, um, period has closed, those comments will come back to us as the technical committee. Then we'll look at each comment that we have received, no matter how many we, we uh, comments we can get, we are going to work on them. Even if there are over 10,000, we are going to work on each comment. Once we have resolved the comments, I or the secretariat will now send uh, uh, um, back the comments with the responses. So if you comment, it doesn't mean you're not going to get a response. So you will comment, we deal with your comment, and then we write a response, then we respond back to you. Okay. And we, we work again in partiality and consensus. So decisions that are based on objective criteria rather than in, uh, on the basis of bias, prejudice, or conferring the benefit of one organization. So when, when we develop a standard, you might find that other organizations, maybe a certain clause on the standard is, it doesn't work for them. They might want us to change the clause only to benefit them. So we do not change standards to benefit one organization, or we do not amend or develop standards to benefit one organization. However, it must benefit everyone uh, uh, in, within the country. And with regard to stakeholders or who, who can join our technical committees, it's uh, uh, anyone who's, um, who's part of the value chain or who's part of the food chain. So if you are part of the value chain or the food chain, you are allowed to join our technical committees and then uh, help us in the process of developing standards. Because remember, as SABS, we don't develop standards. We facilitate the, the development of, or, or, or of national standards, as Veronica have said. So lastly, colleagues, I have a list of uh, food safety related committees uh, that maybe colleagues can want to join. Um, so you you can go through all these uh, uh, technical committees. If you want more information, then you can contact myself or Veronica and we'll give you more information on how you can join. I also have our contact uh, details there for colleagues to join. And uh, I thank you. Um, Tabo, it's such nice words to hear in terms of, you know, while you are referring um, to the SABS in terms of openness, collaboration, facilitation, and I think something that's also very important is the focus that you say that if someone from industry wants to be involved, they can. They just need to attend or, you know, um, become part of the technical committees. So thank you very much for that. Um, I appreciate we will, there is questions coming in, so we will address them just now. But now first I'm handing over to you, Charles, for your presentation. Okay, thank you. Morning again, uh, colleagues. Uh, as uh, Adele has introduced me, my name is Charles Sevilla, uh, working uh, for the certification division within the SAPS. 
Uh, my task is to take you through the um, the uh, let me say certification process uh, where we certify the it is manufacturers or permit holders uh, uh, to uh, to have uh, permits uh, within the SABS. Uh, the reason why I'm using this the the word the permit holders. Uh, is because some manuf uh, some permit holders they are not necessarily manufacturers but they they outsource manufacturing to a third party uh, of which there is a process for that and some permit holders they are direct manufacturers uh, you are a permit holder and you do your own manufacturing so the SAPS uh, accommodates um, uh, uh, both uh, activities so um Okay, um, my first slide is just to to introduce you to the to the mechanics uh, of how SAPS works, more especially when the, when on the certification side. Uh, SAPS gets accredited by uh, different authorities, but in this case, uh, SANAS is the one that comes and audits us and uh, give us um, a permission or give us. Um, a certificate even ourselves for us to come and audit uh, the industry members, be it as manufacturers, permit holders, toll manufacturers, or any stakeholders that uh, uh, will be subjected into, into being audited. So this is a voluntary uh, a process, as Veronica said, uh, is not mandatory. There are other regulatory bodies that um, will come and just enforce uh, the standard requirements as per the industry where those under, uh, those uh, standards are applicable. So we are uh, accredited by the um, by SANAS, which is national. I mean South African National Accreditation System. Um, the presentation covers only two standards, but I'm sure there are other standards that uh, may be you colleagues you might be interested in, of which is very easy. If you want to go and check as to whether those standards also are accredited by SANAS, you can go to the SANAS website and go and check uh, all that information. Uh, then um, the, the, the mark which we are talking about this time around, remember when we say certification, it can be the system, it can be also mark. We call it mark scheme or mark product. Um, which we are talking about right now, which will have uh, that uh, SAPS uh, hamburger, uh, which would be stamped into <clears throat> into your products to prove that you are certified uh, by the SAPS. So um, we don't do any certification um, unless if the there is an existing standard. But there are also mechanics that are involved. Uh, there might be there might be existing standard, but you might find that there are no laboratories that here in South Africa can test or even abroad. So it means that particular um, uh, permits cannot be issued because uh, there are, as I'm saying, mechanics that are involved in issuing the the permit, which we are going to go uh, into. So we have selected only two products. I mean, only two standards. Uh, in this presentation, uh, but there are other standards that are relevant into uh, in the in the food industry. Uh, you have had colleagues uh, speaking about uh, since 1853 and also since 1828. Those are mainly standards that are used in the chemical in the in the in the food industry, of which I think dairy also um, will have an appetite for these standards. 1828 is for cleaning chemicals that are used in the food industry. Then 1853 is uh, disinfectants, detergent, disinfectant, and antiseptic also that are used in the industry. There are also other standards uh, which are used in the food safety, like your lubricants, uh, uh, which uh, they are under uh, since 1829, and also the water treatment, which is 1827. This is just to give you the, the scope of the standard as to what does it entail. 
This information is readily available in the SAPS website. So if you want to get into the details of the scope as to whether uh, your products are covered in the scope, you are more than welcome to, to do that. This uh, scope is for 18, um, uh, 1853. Then the next scope uh, which I'm gonna have is for 1828. So um, it, it clearly tells you as to um, where the, the standard is applicable. So as I'm saying, I'm not going to bore you with uh, the details of the scope. You can look for that information or you can contact us uh, after this. I'm sure also the presentation will be shared um, uh, amongst you so that uh, you can go into final details uh, for this. Uh, then most people, I'm sure some of you are asking as to if we want to be certified by the SAPS, where do we start? What's the whole process? This is our process. Uh, we have an inquiry stage where you are going to be sending your information showing an appetite for SAPS uh, to, uh, to come and certify you. It starts with an application process. Uh, you can call our uh, sales department or our customer partnering. Uh, their numbers, they are easily accessible in our website and uh, they are going to direct you. But the, the, the whole process starts with the application where the pack will be sent to you. You complete the pack, the application is reviewed, a code is issued to you. Then in this code um, uh, review, there is um, there are two there are there, there are two systems that goes parallel. One is an initial stage which we, we call a pre uh, a pre permit activities. It means uh, we are going to be coming into your premises. Uh, there is a cost involved in that. And uh, we collect information which I'm going to uh, talk to, um, information of which our auditors will come back with that information um, <clears throat> uh, for processing. But in there, the sales department will give you also another cost, which will be a post permit activity. Uh, the, the cost involves uh, the duration of um, the activities that must be taken for the duration of the, the permit. The duration of the permit, we call it is 36 months, but most people, they always say it's three years. Why do we say it's 36 months? It's because your permit can, one client or one manufacturer, the permit can be issued in January. The other one can be issued in, uh, in June. Then when we count, it will be June to June. Uh, it means it's 36 months, not necessarily three years calendar year. That is, starts in January up to December. So we need to keep that in mind. So when, when the, the quotation has been um, uh, uh, accepted by the client, then we, we send our auditors into your premises to do the initial assessment. In the initial assessment, uh, they will come and... Um, and, and uh, check whether all your system, starting from your procurement, uh, how you handle customer complaints, uh, are people working in the lines, are they having, do they know what they are doing, be it they need qualifications, uh, we check all that. Then after that, um, we also pick up the sample that will go up to our laboratory. Then what's gonna happen is that uh, the auditor will write an audit report that will be sent to you. If there are gaps that have been identified on the day of the audit, uh, the non-conformance will be issued to you and that they will give you the duration of which it must be cleared or it must be closed. Once that has been done, it means your certification part uh, is complete, then we'll wait for the testing part uh, on the sample that the auditor would have sampled on the day of the audit. When the two uh, um, uh, are available, then that is when we uh, we um, we make an application to the independent uh, team within the SAPS called the approval spot to evaluate that our auditors and the certification department has done uh, everything correctly. Then after that, the permit will be issued uh, um, uh, to that particular um, uh, applicant. Then. 
in 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 that process in fact is more like high level process that i've just uh, uh, i've just uh, uh, explained but in the process there are also nuts and bolts that need to be taken care of for instance when you make an application or even before we always um, ask our clients when they are having an appetite to be certified into they need to start the preliminary or the prerequisite um, uh, activities. One of them is the raw material requirements. All raw material that are used in your foundation must meet a certain standard. You'll see slides which I'm not necessarily going to go into detail because uh, I've already spoken about this. Um, raw materials uh, all the safety data sheets and all that must be assessed. It means your foundation must be assessed by our laboratory. And this is not necessarily, um, let me say, something that auditors will be doing. And it was an agreement between other industries, uh, people in the TC, in the technical committee that my colleagues have spoken to uh, from the standards division, they have said in order for formulations to be protected, the manufacturer or the applicant for the permit must send these formulations directly to the lab for assessment. Then when that assessment a report for formulation comes back, then that is where certification activities start. Um, it's not SABS who said that, it was the industry um, I'm sure there might have been maybe some, uh, maybe it's just a matter of protecting and also uh, for accountability that uh, you know that your formulation went only to one person at the SABS, so it is protected. As soon as you receive a test report for that particular formulation, uh, then that's where the certification activities start, which would be dispatching our um, auditors to your to your to your plant uh, they do the audit uh, both the form for how you manufacture your product and also do the, the sampling so this is just to to emphasize that this formulation assessment must be done and it is a prerequisite um, moving into the next slide uh, this is a high level um, uh, um, uh, pictogram that we have put in here which clearly indicates uh, as to uh, where the, the where the the process starts. Uh, I've already spoken to it, uh, and also I've spoken to that green part, which is a, a three um, or a 36 months uh, period. Of which, after 36 months, when you want your permit to be renewed, uh, there is uh, what you call a recertification process. Uh, which is not different from your normal surveillance process. But what is more important is that there are guiding principles also when it comes to this, of which our sales uh, team will explain to you uh, when it comes to what are requirements for the certificate or the permit holder to meet. Uh, there are two requirements. Uh, one is that um, there must be, there must be uh, testing that is done on annual basis. It means after 36 months, when we make a submission to our approvals board, there must be three test reports that have been done within that 36 months period. Then there must be also six audits that must have been done. We do two audits um, in, in a 12 month space. So it means the first 12 months is two audits, second 12 months, two audits, third 12 months is two audits. So in total, that would be six audits. So, but that would be explained in the, uh, when the application has been made. So this one I've already spoken to, where the assessment must be done on your raw materials, uh, is more like a prerequisite. Uh, in there, I'll go to point E, uh, which is talking about um, the normative, um, uh, normative standard, which is uh, called the SENS uh, 10 to, uh, where um, it tells everyone as to what are, what are pictures that are supposed to be in your level 
So when you do the formulation assessment, uh, you also have to make sure that you send your your level so that it can be assessed. Then moving on into the next slide, um, the the requirements for 1853. You'll see that in 1853 uh, we we talk about uh, the raw material assessment. Uh, they are the same also for uh, for 1828. The whole notion of this is to ensure that toxic or harmful raw materials are not being used as these um, uh, raw materials are used uh, for human consumption. So that's the whole idea. So irrespective whether it's for cleaning or it's for disinfecting and also antiseptic, the, 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 the requirement is the same. So I've already spoken about uh, the formulation assessment as a prerequisite. This is between the manufacturer and also the lab. So point number two uh, is uh, the testing also must be done then uh, and also the audit for your factory as to how you are manufacturing your products and also uh, how you use your raw materials or your raw material and all that. And also the level, um, uh, the label and, and markings. Remember, the label gets assessed twice. It assessed based on that standard that I've spoken to, which is uh, uh, SENS 10234, but the, the standard itself, which is 1853 and 1828, has its own requirements. So we mustn't mix the two, so, so that um, you, you can understand how the, the whole process works. So um, I've put here uh, also a slide to explain what normative references mean. Normative references, they are as good as um, the requirements of the standard. So they are mandatory. You'll see that for 1853, there are quite a number of uh, mandatory um, or normative references. So it means as a manufacturer, you need to abide by these standards. You need to know what these standards entail. You need to ensure that you apply all information that these standards are providing, not necessarily 1853, which you are going to be certified against. So the very same also for 1828, the are normative uh, reference, references. Uh, the most common one that I've seen is uh, this sense since um, 10234, which tells you uh, as to what is it that you have to do in your labeling, uh, as uh, you can see that uh, it's a global harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals. Then moving on to the next slide. Um, this one is, um, we have just taken a sample of a test report. Your test report uh, for, I think this is uh, maybe 1853 or 1828, uh, the lab after testing, they will give a test report. There are two types of test reports that they give. is a compliant test report and a non-compliant test report. If your product is non-compliant, uh, we are going to tell you that uh, there are gaps in your products, uh, and then a retest must be, must be conducted. Also in there, there are mechanics that goes with it. If it is something not to do with any formulation or that doesn't, um, um, the retesting, or maybe when you work your formulation, it doesn't necessarily change the performance of your product. We can only test that particular parameter, not necessarily all parameters. But if you tamper with your formulation, it means the whole testing must be done. And this is an additional cost that um, uh, you are going to uh, absorb on your side. But if it is a compliant test report, there is nothing to worry about. Then the SAPS will continue with all activities as normal. Then the this other one on the far right will be a permit. Your permit will look like this, but this is the front page of the permit. The permit has a front page and there the, the are also ancillary uh, pages. The ancillary page is called a permit schedule. This permit schedule is the one that, number one, tells everyone as to where, where you are, 
so that when there is a reference, they know as to whom they have to conduct as a client. It has the address where it has an address for the permit holder, but if the permit holder is using a toll manufacturer, it will also have a toll manufacturer address. Uh, we call this redress where people need to know as to where they need to uh, go when your product is not necessarily working. Okay. Then also in that permit schedule, it clearly stipulates the types of products or the products or the brands that this particular front page has. Remember, front page will say, uh, Mr. Client, uh, Charles Sibia, uh, you are certified for 1853 or 1828, but it doesn't give details. Details are given in other pages, which will be the permit schedule. Then that will conclude my presentation. Uh, I've tried to cover as much as I can unless if um, yeah there are maybe some points that i need to give clarity on uh, thanks adele thank you so much um charles that was uh, a lot of information and i think a clear understanding um for people to know where they must start um, should they want to get their products tested and what the process is so, um, Yompi, I don't know from your side if there is any questions that you would like to ask. Um, I've got questions from the audience. Um, some of them are technical of nature and quite lengthy, but I'm going to try my utmost best to read them in such a way that um, I hope that I convey the question. But Yompi, from your side, is there a question that um. you would like? Adele, no, I, I don't have a specific question. I think the um, the presentations that we just heard, excellent, and I think it opens the floor towards um, a far better understanding of the processes and what it entails. Um, it's very important for the dairy industry to understand, and specifically when you spoke, Charles, about the issue of we cannot allow toxic raw materials to be used in the the, um, the materials that at the end of the day should assist with food safety assurance. So thank you for that. And it brings, uh, it, it emphasizes the fact of SABS certification on products and whether you are a user of the products or an auditor or a manufacturer, it spells out the critical issue, how important it is for everybody in the value chain to contribute to food safety. And I really want to express my gratitude for for you guys to participate in this event. Thank you so much. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much for that, Yombi. Okay, so I'm going to try my utmost best to formulize this question. I'm going to read it as um, Aaron has put the question down for us. He basically says, please, can you clarify the following, as there seems to be some confusion in this regard. He says, SABS can perform various functions. In other words, they develop standards, they carry out testing and products to ensure that these standards are met. They certify products that have been tested and that meet the standards. However, if a cleaning chemo chemical conforms to all SANS 1828 standards, namely uh, it's a non-hazardous toxic raw materials being used in the formulation, it contains no perfumes or colorants. It's suitable for purpose and pH value when applicable. Corrosion resistance. It produced a facility which has been um, SANS 9001, so it's got a, it's, um, a quality certified. The product labeling, assuming the product has been tested to the above requirements by a suitable certification and testing body like um, SABS, Intertech, and NSF. Then that product is considered as being a cleaning chemical for the use in the food industry. So in summary, as long as the parameters are tested and conform to the requirements, the products are considered in compliance with SANS 1828, even if the product does not necess necessarily carry a SAS, um, SABS permit. Is the, is the question clear to either Veronica, Theo or Charles? 
Uh, I'm not sure whether I can attempt this one. Um, uh, the, 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 the question is, um, it's about testing that the product conforms to all, like it can be used as a detergent, it can be used as an as a, as a antiseptic, and also it can be used as a, as a disinfectant, that it conforms to the requirement of the standard. So what is the question? So uh, the question is, uh, it says, in summary, as you, uh, so it conforms with SANS 1828, but it says it doesn't necessarily carry a SABS permit. Ah, uh, so, okay. Um, um, let me, in fact, I did try to explain that. For, um, to have a permit is a voluntary initiative that um, that manufacturers does or agent do. It's a voluntary, um, um, let me say, activity uh, for yeah. their own business. Uh, it, it's more like a business appetite or it's a business um, requirement where they don't want to go around to their clients and say, you know what, we are doing the right thing. Remember that SAPS will is a third party for conformity assessment who comes audit and we issue uh, a permit okay um that's number one it means it's a voluntary process but when you are talking about the regulatory bodies unfortunately we cannot speak on their behalf but uh, some people will do the testing and the regulatory uh, bodies will come and want to verify that testing was done. Remember, if you have a mark, it means that testing is already done and you are getting even more uh, by uh, putting your stamp into the SAPS. So um, that, that will depend on the, on the regulatory body as to what is it that they are looking for. But remember also, when it comes to testing alone, um, the testing alone doesn't have what we call um, uh, like your, your surveillance activities. SAPS also conducts surveillance activities. If you take your product into any lab, be it is Intertech, SGS, and SAPS, you only do testing for that particular batch, for that particular product at any given time. There are no other surveillance activities by a third party. So, but the SAPS does these surveillances. So some, I would think, maybe some regulatory bodies, they will say, this testing was only done, let me say, 18 months ago. Then what are you doing? Uh, why are you no longer testing? Whereas with the SAPS, there is a continuous testing that we are doing and also continuous engagement with you uh, as, a, as a permit holder. So I'm not sure whether that explains um, what the question is, but uh, the long and short of it, to have a permit is not a compulsory, is voluntary. Um, we do the testing in there, which uh, the manufacturer can always use that test report into the regulatory bodies. But if the testing, irrespective of whether the testing has been done with SAPS or any other other lab, but there is a backlash that uh, one can get into saying you only tested two years ago, so where is the recent test report? Whereas if you have a mark, uh, that uh, that automatically uh, gets covered, and uh, you don't have to have any worries. Thank you. Okay, that is a very clear answer. Thank you so much, Charles. I hope um, that answers. If not. Um, I'm sure of it. Um, you can contact Charles directly and um, discuss further with him. Then, um, Charles, here's another question for you. What is SABS 51276? Is it a test method or is it um, similar than SANS 1853? It was on one of your slides. So, Kevin is asking, what is SABS 51276? Um, I think on top of my head, in fact, I deal with these numbers uh, quite a lot. 
Um, I think this one is for efficacy testing, if I'm not, um, it's a test method, I think, for efficacy testing. But so we can verify that. Um, and also, all this information and all these standards, they are available at the, at the SAPS website. Um, you can buy information or you can browse. It will give you uh, the, the scope of that particular standard. Uh, on this one, I think, um, in fact, uh, uh, I'll have to maybe, if you can send those questions to me so that I can quickly look into it. But it, it, it sounds as if this is a test method for efficacy testing. I may be wrong, but I'll have to check. I'll have to check on this one. 100% no problem. Um, Kevin, we can definitely make sure that you get the, the right answer. Then um, I've got another technical question. So Veronica Tabu, I don't know if this is more in your wheelhouse or it would be Charles. Um, I think it's for you, Veronica. Um, the first speaker mentioned the standards are not regulations. Perhaps one of the speakers can discuss the NRCS how they split from the SABS, how disinfectants are regulated in South Africa, and how the law requires registration with the NRCS of a disinfectant, and how the NRCS makes specific allowance for registration of a disinfectant that is to be used in the food industry. Uh, I'm not sure. Veronica, do you want to take to take this or you want me to take it? Um, you can give it a go, Charles, and then um, I will add on to what you are saying if there is a need for me to add on. Okay. Um, long time ago, SA, SABS had what you call regulatory powers. But because of um, uh, the HWO and uh, also the ISO affiliation with, uh, with the, the SAPS, and um, also the Standards Act itself, it called, the Standard Act is, is plain into saying standards are, um, they are developed for, for South Africans and also for any interested party uh, who want to use the standard. So um, it was a conflict of interest for SAPS to be developing the standards and after that regulating those standards. But before that was allowed, uh, I'm talking about the old regime, but in the new regime that was not allowed. Hence NRCS, uh, was um, was uh, became sort of like an independent entity from the SAPS. Unfortunately, we cannot be talking as to the mechanics and how they do their their work. But um, on a high level, depending on the on the safety, remember, NRCS will regulate anything that has to do with safety, be it is electrical, it's food, it's uh, chemicals and all that. So if it is safety, um, if it has a safety, uh, let me say, a hazard, uh, it must be regulated. That is what NRCS does. And I'll recommend that maybe you get in touch with the SAPS so that they can explain as to how they do this uh, the regulatory part. So uh, the SABS, um, yeah, it was it was a matter of um, the SABS cannot develop the standards, but at the same time be a referee for the very same standards. And um, the SABS was only left with uh, the the permit and the certification side, uh, the standards development, but the regulatory part was taken. Uh, into into the say into into the NRCS. Unfortunately, as I'm saying, uh, we are not necessarily uh, having much information as to how they conduct their business. Uh, Veronica, you can add on some of um, of maybe what I might have left uh, in the in my answer. Sufficiently covered, Charles. I I have nothing to add. Thank you. 
Yes, and um, the delegate also says that you have answered it uh, sufficiently and she understands that um, the NRC is, um, is uh, the regulatory body in terms of the, the disinfectants. Then I've got another question and that is in terms of how can we access detergents tested by the SABS for people in the agro and processing um, environments? So I assume it's in terms of understanding uh, which products are um, um, you know, certified and can be used. Is there a list on SABS or is it mostly the companies that has got certification that is listed with you? Uh, in fact, um, you can, our website does have um, all companies that have been uh, that have been certified by the SABS. But uh, the schedule which I was talking about is when you have identified that particular company, you will have to speak directly to that company uh, to give you the schedule or else get a consent from them for the SABS to release that schedule. Remember, uh, the relationship becomes the SAPS and the permit holder. So if someone else comes and say, you know what, can I have this information? There must be a consent coming from the from the permit holder. But uh, the the information itself, uh, it is there. But uh, the question was, how do you get hold of test reports? You won't necessarily see the test reports. The test reports will be with the company. The only thing that you are going to see is which company has been certified under which standard by the SAPS. That's uh, that's what our website will show you. Wonderful. And it's um, like you said, if you then get a company that you know that's certified, you can contact them and you can ask them for their permit schedule. And that will indicate to them which product um, has been certified. Charles, Veronica, and Tabu and Yongdi, Thank you so much for your time today and um, thank you to the DSA for hosting these webinars and making sure that they get the presenters and the topics to present it to industry. As you know, um, we record all our webinars and they are posted on our Food Focus website. We always try to do it within the same week of the webinar and we will also, with the permission of our presenters today, have the presentation slides um, with the recording for you to um, contact them or to look at it again. So please look out for that on our social media platform um, when it will be posted. Please note, after the webinar, there will be a short survey. Please answer the questions because that also provides us with more information, understanding what um, you would like to know more about. Please note, there is an automatic um, a certificate that gets generated by the GoToWebinar platform and you will be informed of this tomorrow and you will be able to download your certificate. But please note, if you miss that or if you don't download it, um, I cannot unfortunately issue another one as this happens automatically from the GoToWebinar platform. We are looking forward, the DSA are hosting another webinar in October on the 25th Please make sure to look out to see to it what the topic is. And with that, um, I would want to say thank you speakers once again. And to all the delegates that attended, please have a great day until the next time we meet. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, speakers. Goodbye.